If y'all would take a seat, we'd, uh, we'd like to go ahead and get started. If you would, take a seat. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to call this meeting of the House Transportation Committee to order. And I'd like to say, first of all, thanks to the House Committee members for being here. This is a joint meeting that was called. I know from Senator Mullis, the chairman of the Senate Transportation, has sent word that he is tied up in an appropriations hearing. Some of their meetings were backed up, so some of the members may be tied up in, in their appropriation meetings and other meetings. So. Some may come in late, and that is great, and some of our mem members may come in late, and I know some of you have to leave to go to another meeting, so just appreciate the ones here. I'm going to ask uh, Representative Tom Graves if he would uh, introduce our guest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, this, um, as you know, the, our chairman of transportation seems to have taken the committee to a new level, and today's a great example of, of where he's, uh, he's leading us. And back in November, I had the opportunity to hear from our guest speaker along with some other leaders in Atlanta, and, and uh, I was uh, extremely impressed with uh, the time and the effort and the proposal that he's put forth, and I think he will as well. Robert Poole is from the Reason Foundation, which you know is from California. He, he uh, actually telecommutes from Fort Lauderdale and has taken time today to fly up this morning and spend the day with us and, and to make this presentation. I think you'll, you'll be impressed with it. I hope you'll keep an open mind and, and be ready to ask some questions at the end because uh, he's put a lot of time into this, and I think it's a great proposal and a, a great uh, uh, alternative, I guess, alternative solutions to what uh, we've all been hearing about, and that's congestion in Atlanta. So with that, Mr. Robert Poole. Condenses. Uh, thank you for the technical assistance here. Great. Slideshow. Condenses a 75-page report that Reason Foundation released in uh, November. Uh, this report was done entirely on our own hook. It was not commissioned by anyone. It's part of a national research effort that Reason Foundation is conducting over a period of about three years to take a fresh look at this enormous problem of urban traffic congestion in the major cities all across the, the country. Atlanta is hardly alone in facing this, this major problem. Uh, we picked Atlanta uh, as a, to do a case study on for several reasons. One is that Atlanta has always had a progressive pro-growth uh, uh, atmosphere. It's a very uh, business-friendly area. Uh, Georgia has already passed some innovative legislation allowing for hot lanes and allowing for public-private partnerships, which uh, fewer than half of all states have done that. So we figured that uh, Atlanta would be a good, a, a place that the kind of recommendations we thought we would make might actually be taken very seriously. And so uh, with that, let's, uh, let's proceed uh, with the, the uh, presentation. First, uh, the underlying method, method message is that congestion is not only a huge problem today, but it's a problem that's going to grow worse if the status quo continues. Uh, the standard measure of how bad congestion is is called the travel time index. It's developed and measured by the Texas Transportation Institute for the 86 largest metro areas across the country. They measure it every year. Atlanta's uh, travel time index is 1.46 right now. That means it takes 46 percent longer to make a trip at rush hour than it does at off hours. Now that's the average overall. Of some particular freeways it's much worse than that, but that's the average overall the whole roadway system of metro Atlanta. Um, the ARC in their long-range plan projects that if the plan is implemented as currently written, and I know they're in the process of revising, but as currently written, uh, that that travel time index would be worse. Uh, it would be 1.67 by 2030. Reason's own research in a separate report projected it would be even worse than that. It would be over 1.8, uh, which would make it Atlanta in 2030 worse than L.A. is today. L.A. today has the nation's highest congestion at 1.75. So not only a serious problem today, but likely to get worse uh, if the status quo policies continue. And uh, uh, just the Texas Transportation Institute for every metro area calculates the value based on that measure of congestion, the value of time wasted stuck in traffic, and the value of extra fuel burned by cars and stop and go. And their figure for Atlanta is $1.75 billion per year. 
Now, we actually know, according to the chief economist at USDOT, that the true total cost to a region's economy of traffic congestion is a lot worse, a lot more than just the value of individuals' wasted time and fuel. It's probably about double that. So you're looking at over $3 billion a year cost today to the economy of Metro Atlanta from, from congestion, and worse in the future. The plan, as I said, is similar to long-range plans all over the country. The Atlanta we did not single out Atlanta's plan to say it's not very effective at dealing with congestion. Uh, it's, focus, it's, it's a product of the thinking of the 90s when everybody believed that the smart thing to do would be to uh, solve congestion by reducing the demand for travel by making it easy to carpool and providing lots of transit. I mean, everybody thought that would work. And so the, the, the investment priorities in the plan are very heavily focused on transit and carpool lanes and, and not that much on highways. And yet, and yet, these are the figures, again, that come out of ARC. Their own figures project that after doing all that to spend a lot, a lot of the resources available on carpool lanes and transit, by 2030, uh, the changes in, in how people drive to work, how people get to work, excuse me, would be almost negligible. You'd still have over 80% driving alone, you'd have a slightly smaller fraction carpooling. After all the expenditure of building hundreds of miles of uh, more of carpool lanes, many hundreds of miles more, and only another you know, one and a half percentage point increase in percentage of people using mass transit to get to work. Now, that's not our figures. That's the ARC's figures. That says to me, you know, if you're serious about reducing congestion, you've got to start with, a, with a, a fresh approach and come up with something better than that because that's, that's clearly not, not going to change behavior enough to make any. And their own figures show that they project that the travel time index in 2030 will be 1.67, much worse than today's. Now, why doesn't this model reduce congestion? I mean, it may you know, provide better transit options for people and so forth. But the underlying reason, and this has been studied by demographers, is that the density here is far too low to make transit, especially fixed rail transit, a viable alternative for most of the trips that people have to make. Jobs today are increasingly in the suburbs. This is, again, it's not true only of Atlanta. It's true of most parts of the United States, other than New York and, and a few others that have big traditional downtowns that have a large share of the jobs. But in Atlanta, like most places, most of the jobs are, uh, job growth in particular is in the suburbs. And uh, most commuting is suburb for suburb. And just a few figures to illustrate this. This is, uh, the we often see Europe as a model, and transit works in Europe. And it, does, it does work in Europe, it's because the European cities are, were formed before the automobile was a viable mode of transportation. They're much, much denser. Here are two places uh, in 1990 with about 2.5 million people, Barcelona and Atlanta. Transit really works in Barcelona. But look at the difference. These are at the same scale. That's the area of Barcelona, that little blip in the bottom right. And all the rest of that is the area of Metro Atlanta. Same population, spread way out. You can, nobody, nobody is a genius enough or has enough money to make transit a viable means of getting, of going from point A to point B over that huge area in the kind of, of resources that actually are available. Here is a, a picture, it's, I apologize for the detail, but the, this shows all the additional jobs added in the metro area between 1990 and 1998. And it's measured, the, the bottom, across the bottom is how far from the central business district uh, uh, you go. And as you can see, uh, the red shows jobs located within a half a mile of a, of a MARTA station. Uh, the blue is jobs located within half a mile of a bus stop. And, uh, uh, and the above the line are positive job additions, below the line are job losses. You can see there are job losses in downtown where it's closest to transit. And the vast bulk of the jobs were outside the reach of where you're anywhere near any kind of a transit stop uh, in the suburbs far from the traditional downtown. I mean, that's the reality that we're facing with if we're going to do something about congestion. And here, this is a breakdown of the latest, the census data from, from 70, 80, 90, and 2000 censuses showing the patterns of commuting for Atlanta, suburb to suburb, has become the dominant mode of commuting. I mean, you can't change that. I can't change that. That's a fact that we have to start from if we're going to craft an effective solution to congestion. Another factor, we took a look, not a detailed look, but a comparative look. The report has about eight different metro areas showing the, the configuration of the freeway systems. Uh, 
the freeways are not the whole thing by any means, but they're the most important part of, of the transportation system. Atlanta has one of the most radially oriented freeway systems in the country. It's, it's configured to feed downtown as if the main commuting was from suburbs to downtown. You know, the model of New York, the model of Washington, D.C., the model of Chicago. It's not true here. And yet that's the shape. You look at Dallas. Dallas has much more of a spider web network, and they're increasingly adding to that network as, as they deal with the suburbanization of jobs as well as housing. Uh, and this is the trend in Phoenix. It's a trend in Denver. It's a trend in a number of other metro areas that are accepting the reality that, uh, that that's how their growth is going and that they need to provide the, the adequate infrastructure to, to handle those trips. Now, just as we started our work in December of 2005, the Governor's Congestion Mitigation Task Force came out with their uh, report endorsed by all four major agencies, ARC and the DOT, Greta and CERTA, uh, saying that there really should be a fundamental change in how we approach congestion in Atlanta. And that was another, I mean, we didn't know they were going to come out with it. We knew the task force was working on it. And that was another factor that led us to choose Atlanta for this case study. Uh, but the shift, ma major shift in course to set a goal of reducing the level of the travel time index, instead of allowing it to increase to much worse, to actually make it better by 2030, and to reconfigure the transportation plan to try to accomplish that. And a major, the two major tools for doing that, number one, would be to change the, the weighting in selecting all the different projects that would go into the plan. Instead of making the impact on reducing congestion just one of 10 or 12 factors, so relatively small impact, lots of other things getting heavy weight, make 70% of the weighting factor for choosing which projects to put money into to be how much does this project reduce congestion. Now that, believe me, will make a huge difference and will, will reconfigure things dramatically once they get finished figuring that out. And the other is to develop a serious benefit-cost methodology to select between projects for how much bang for the buck do you get, how much congestion reduction per dollar. It's important that each project you choose have an impact, but you then you also have to choose to invest wisely. How much public sector money do you put in versus how much you get back in congestion reduction. So we've considered this is a major change, of course. And so then we saw our project, in other words, in doing this case study, to figure, well, all right, if you really want to do that, what would it take? What, you know, we tapping the best minds in transportation. Uh, there's a distinguished advisory board for this project of about 30 people all across the country in universities and, and other DOTs, so forth. How do we do that? Well, we know a lot about congestion. Congestion, about half of all the congestion in Atlanta is caused by incidents. So it's not the same predictable thing every day. Uh, it's it's uh, bad weather, it's accidents, uh, it's a construction zone that's temporary and so forth. And so we know putting in uh, better video cameras, which is already underway, and there's a pretty good uh, 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 network of video cameras surveilling the freeway system. Freeway service patrols to give people who are out of gas, uh, uh, gas and so forth and get them out of traffic. Uh, those things are well underway.